Thank you. I, I'm grateful to be here in Aspen. The, the week has been a great learning experience for all of us. What I have is a shift of emphasis. I want to talk about resilience as a change of mind. You'll see what I mean by the end. I'm going to share as the session title promises a good amount of studies, practical studies that have been done for various agencies, both in the U.S. and internationally. First, let me make a remark about our Society for Risk Analysis. Of course, you all are invited to our annual meeting that's going to begin in three days. I'm the chair for the meeting and the president-elect, and we are expanding to Africa, regional chapter, India, regional chapter. We just had our World Congress in Singapore in July, a great success, and Dr. Linkov here at this meeting was a key organizer of that meeting. We are taking the theme of empires of risk analysis. It's the 200th anniversary of Battle of Waterloo, the 150th anniversary of the U.S. Civil War. And it's important to, this is a, a bridge commemorating the Waterloo Battle in London, some of you all may know it better than I do. Napoleon himself had a definition of resilience. Do you know what it was? Nope. Those who, are, who know where they're going from the start will never go far. And he, he's identified as the most significant individual in history of the last 500 years. So I think it's something to pay attention to. And it's very much going to resonate in the practical studies I'm about to show you. So I worked with uh, a good number of agencies, the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S., Army Corps of Engineers, with the Federal Highway Administration, part of U.S. DOT, and others. I had many Ph.D. students that collaborated on this work, and so I want to uh, acknowledge all their contributions to this. Uh, in particular, a, a team that I worked with uh, for DHS on, uh, on the first uh, motivating case study I'm going to show you. So uh, this is wh what I mean when I describe a shift of emphasis, is uh, we are coming from uh, a stream of reliability, risk, science, going back 50, 100 years and thousands of years, uh, as uh, uh, Jose described to us last evening, that uh, risk co was constituted in the first issue of our society's journal in 1981, as focusing on likelihoods and consequences of adverse events. In 1990, my colleague, uh, now in the University of Virginia, described risk management as what can be done and what are the trade-offs and the impacts of current decisions on future options. So it was a hint that we would be talking about resilience today because it brings this time frame in. The ISO uh, framework for risk that we uh, definition standard we've been discussing some this week, it has described risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And everything I'm going to show you henceforth, I'm going to be talking about risk as the influence of scenarios to priorities, and particular to priorities that enhance resilience. And uh, these works I'm very happy to share with you from my webpage and email and, and, and other ways. So this is a little bit of uh, defining as everyone's been uh, participating in. Uh, this week. I have, uh, in working with all these agencies, had some uh, interest in what does it mean to constitute a program for risk, for resilience, for safety, and so on. And very uh, infrequently, there's a, an office of climate in these agencies. So I think everything I'm going to tell you in the next few uh, moments, it applies to the office of climate risk or climate vulnerability within a large agency or within a government or, in, or a large corporation. So I've uh, posited three defining questions of risk, safety, security, and let's say resilience programs. What are the risks to be addressed? What are the, uh, that is, are meteor strikes in bounds? Are uh, uh, viruses in bounds? Or those are not in the scope of our program. What are the resources, horizons, organizations, uh, allocations of resources across uh, time horizons and organizations, and how is performance of the program going to be monitored into the future? I'm very happy to share that paper with you. So uh, what did I mean earlier? Uh, st uh, 
scenarios are influencing our priorities. I uh, am suggesting to you that our priorities are really how we might see ourselves in our own minds, uh, that we are, we're constantly updating uh, uh, entities, lists of entities in our mind. We have uh, individuals that we value. We have uh, places on the earth. We have books and papers and reports. So uh, always shifting, and uh, that's, that's how I uh, uh, want to say some of these uh, agencies and governments are, are uh, making their own priorities. The scenarios are not a probability space. They are not mutually exclusive and uh, not necessarily repeatable from day to day. So much of what I showed you, we said it's success if we get a different result on Tuesday than Monday. And the sources of those scenarios are in climate change, in climate phenomenon, in social behavioral uh, factors, in geopolitical, in, tech, in new technologies and innovations, and regulatory change and many other uh, nature of factors. And what I'm going to share to you is a, a churning of these scenarios from the long lists through uh, some mechanism uh, I'm calling resilience analytics in this talk to find some few scenarios that might matter and that might be disruptive. And, and foremost, these scenarios are, are the uh, statement of resilience analytics because all of this is with some quantification. And uh, these are the papers that I offered to share. I'm uh, saying here that decision science has something to say about resilience analytics and that all of this uh, leads to some latest work that I've been doing with some PhD students. So here's a motivating case. It has not much to do with climate, but a little to do with climate, as I'll uh, tell you by the end. Is uh, My sponsor was interested in dirty bomb threats to the national capital region. And actually, they were interested in all events of all kinds, stressors of all kinds. We focused on dirty bombs as a good example. Uh, there was no such dirty bomb attack to anyway to this region in, in history. And so we had a, a, a little bit of a hypo hypothesis making and scenario building to do. We collected data from 2,000 individuals where they were at particular times of day and where they might need to move if they heard on the internet or television or radio or from their neighbor that there was a, a pending incident or that dirty bomb attacks had occurred. And uh, this is some 3,000 uh, surveys deployed by cell phone and other. And in the end, we got something that looks quite like climate and weather uh, and mm -hmm. flooding inundation maps, mm -hmm. right? And which I thought I was coming to this meeting to see more of those. Uh, and it hasn't been the case. These are travel times from the center of the district out uh, to West Virginia, to Pennsylvania, folks who were heading out of town, how long it would take. And this, this outer contour is 48 hours. So a trip that's in normal conditions three hours, it's taking up to two days to get out of, out of the town. So uh, this was the context, though. And immediately, I, I, you know, I was part of the work that developed those contours. But I said, Let, let's see, uh, are there some assumptions we can make about behaviors and uh, uh, changes of, that, that might change our minds about priorities that I ta told you exist earlier? <laughs> so we focused on, uh, from, that, from that work that we'd done, the technical uh, part with the travel times, we came up with some behavioral assumptions about where, what would people do, what would they believe, who would, whom would they trust, and uh, what's the extent of their uh, uh, walking wounded and so on, and not knowledge of what's a walking wounded. Five key behavioral assumptions. Please keep uh, these in mind. What they are is not so important as what I'm about to do with them. We created about uh, three dozen initiatives for resilience. That was the interest of the agency. These are providing more shelters, uh, making the... Uh, the uh, long uh, distance communities more aware of needs, uh, what would be the stockpiling of medicines and so on and on, on and on. These are in infrastructure and public health and many more. K please keep the initiatives in mind for resilience. And then uh, performance criteria, of course. So these came from the agency. They're those that are familiar to you. We made some assessments of the initiatives on the performance criteria. That's a, a, a routine action and uh, made some racking and stacking, which initiatives come to the top. And then importantly, for each of the five uh, uh, assumptions of behaviors, these are mega uh, uh, trends and so on, we asked which of the, where's going to be shift in importance or change of mind 
Okay, that's in the, in the title of the talk that I provided for today. So we're saying, by thinking about scenarios, by having them in the front of your information, it's going to change your priorities, make a shift in priorities, just as if the, the uh, financial collapse in the 2008, it shifted our priorities and, and we became uh, putting fiscal uh, responsibility more toward the front. We, we update the uh, prioritization of initiatives <laughs> and get a result something like the following, is that what was a top initiative under the baseline case, that's where the diamond is, it gets buffeted about when we consider the behavioral assumptions. And what do we want to be in our agencies, in our, in our uh, uh, actions as professionals, is we want our plans and our priorities and these lists, we want them to be resilient all into the future. So, and, and particularly in, in this study, we want them to be resilient to the behavioral scenarios. So uh, you can see here the title, this is the, the statement of, uh, uh, of resilience analytics. I'm exploring the influence of uncertain behaviors on the priority order of initiatives, which is what I promised you up in the front. This is for the dirty bomb case. And uh, this, all this is is a zoom in on that uh, chart that I just showed you earlier. The fact that uh, some of those initiatives that were close to the top were the planning for shelter in place, assuming you couldn't travel far, you might stay in your home or be ordered to stay at home or work. And then uh, and another initiative for education and training for uh, decontamination and so on. That's, a, I told you, a, three, a list three dozen long, and it's uh, um, buffeted by assumptions. And uh, we created uh, some metrics of how much each behavioral assumption was going to buffet the priorities. These are least and most influential assumptions here. Highest ranked initiatives, lowest ranked initiatives, where do the scenarios have their effect? I'm going to tell you in a slide apiece about some other studies where I deployed this. All right, this is uh, prioritizing uh, coastal region of Virginia priorities for uh, the threat to uh, sea level rise. There was no agency for climate in the, in the Department of Transportation that was sponsoring this. There is Office of Climate at the high level in DOT. They sponsored me in this work. So I'm going to show you I've prioritized uh, future projects and reprioritized them with various assumptions of climate change. It's better than that because I mixed climate change with wear and tear, climate change with travel demand, climate change with ecological shift, climate change with economic downturn. Why did I do that? Because no one owned climate, the topic, but there were owners of these other topics. <laughs> okay, uh, this is uh, the same, a similar explanation as I uh, described to you earlier. Uh, the, the climate scenarios and others, they buffet the rankings. I ranked not only the future projects, but the, the existing assets, the bridges and the tunnels and the, the uh, uh, highway sections. I ranked also a set of 30 policies that had been devised by the top, the, 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 uh, top level agency. These policies are go green, develop uh, more pedestrian, uh, put more traveler information systems. So re-ranking, this is what I told you, is in the mind of the agency. Re-ranking policies, assets, uh, projects, future projects. And then here's the footprint. This is uh, resilience analytics uh, on the gr at the ground level. The, uh, the base scenario, it didn't buffet the uh, rankings at all. The climate change scenario, climate alone, this is sea level rise and temp uh, days of extreme temperature and so on. There was some, some uh, shifting in the priorities, re-ranking of assets. The, uh, the bigger the, the color object here, the more buffeting is going on. Climate and ecology, moderate. Climate plus wear and tear, climate plus economic downturn. It was only when we combined climate with the projections for travel demand, we got a big shift. So is, is, uh, this is the, the resilience scenario of, of import here. I'm doing the same for uh, the roadmap of technologies for vehicle to grid, for batteries. I have a, a, a major project with uh, agency in Virginia and um, uh, this is a, a technology that's being commercialized. Is it resi are the business plans resilient to some of those same uh, uh, factors I described to you earlier? With, with Dr. Linkov, I've been working on in Afghanistan with USAID to prioritize infrastructure for development with all kinds of uh, conditions and scenarios inserted to that. The question is, is the electric grid of Afghanistan resilient to future uh, shifts in, in, uh, shifts in the uh, uh, regulation, political, military, and so on. 
We did it also for Alaska erosion. Each of these has a paper associated with it. And here's my uh, concluding slide, is that I want you to be thinking uh, of <coughs> resilience as a change of mind and how, how uh, the knowledge of scenarios is going to shift your, your, your priorities. And uh, think about Napoleon next week at our uh, risk analysis annual meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Two or so questions for Jim. Uh, so let's go to Roger and Pat. Roger is a past president of the Society uh, for Risk Analysis. One of, one of the, um, the things that I've been interested in is, is looking at, at some of the data we have on changes in social trust in the United States. And you had it as one of your key behavioral assumptions, and then you also indicated how important it was uh, in resilience. If the trend lines continue in the United States, is there any reason to believe that that uh, uh, some of these necessary steps in resilience will occur? Well, there's two things. By analyzing that topic, we're influencing it. And so that's a little bit of my message right here. When I asked that question in the survey, we were, we were interested in trust in several dimensions. Do you trust the the, the the channel by which you received the information? Do you trust the source, the purported source of the information? Do you trust the message itself? And how is the study that we're going to do, how does it change your, and influence your trust? It's a great question. I'm, I'm glad uh, to be in your thinking. So I'm not as familiar with uh, some of the methods, but is there, do you see that there's any possibility to take some of your scenarios uh, and the assumptions, which are essentially rules of behavior, or potential rules of behavior, um, and sort of feed it into something like what Kirk just showed in terms of looking at the possible interactions between different activities, different variables, different behaviors, and that I, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's the best I, I can tell you on that, is when you find some scenarios that matter, you ought to be working on the sub-scenarios and the sub-sub-scenarios, and that those that matter, they become part of your R&D roadmap. So as scientists here, we're going to work on important problems when we uh, make this as a preface or prelude or precursor to our science investigations. So this is lock and key or hand in hand with, with what we do as scientists, as geophysicists, and all the rest. That's a great question. Thank you. And an, an example is we, we might find that the, uh, the, uh, the trust issue comes to the front. So then we're going to define a bunch of scenarios that have that relate to the trust and go more in depth and we'll have, a, have an analysis on Wednesday, on Thursday and Friday. It's a learning process. Okay, last question from Billy. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff, Jim, particularly your scenario around Dirty Bomb. We have an EU project that is looking at exactly that. It's called S-HELP and it stands for Security of Health and Emergency Training and Planning and Learning and Planning. And it's it's really linked to all that, that resilience analytics. And I'll actually share the link with you now on that project. Thank you very much. I think the best outcome of that study was to get us thinking about the, the populations, the needs of individuals and subgroups, and uh, particularly migrant populations. Uh, the, the, the capital region, the number one immigrant uh, group is from El Salvador, from uh, uh, Latin America. So we, we have to be dealing with that group uh, as a consequence of what we found in this survey. Everybody gets uh, uh, consideration. Thank you.